Welcome to topic 10, Dr. H's Artifacts of Import. This is the last top primary topic in this unit. Over the next two videos, we're gonna talk about some artifacts of importance and not so importance in both the aeronautics and the astronautics field. Video one is about aeronautics, video two is about astronautics. And as we go through this, I want you to think about how each of these artifacts links back to the topics we've discussed to date. Also, it's time for you to try to figure out what my favorite aircraft is. So it's the aeronautic side of things. We'll have a little poll quiz in the next session on, on Monday, um, and then we'll reveal all. So as we get started, as always, we have our questions. Um, which air engineering, aerospace engineering artifact should you remember? The answer is all of them, obviously. I want you to remember every artifact there ever was, even the ones you don't know about yet. But no, really, which ones are important in terms of the history and the linkage and the technology and the development of science? I.e., which ones set the standard for all that came later in their line? And we've already talked about that a little bit, and we'll talk about it some more. And then which ones were really useful for pointing down roads we really don't want to go down? And there's some classic ones in both aeronautics and astronautics. And then there are a number of artifacts, which really are, in my opinion, overhyped. We tend to think much more highly of them or think of them very highly for the wrong reasons. So I want you to think about those as we go and why that's the case and why some of the also rams are actually more important than some of the really well-known ones. So we're going to start with aeronautics and fixed wing. And this I think is the fun bit. So here's the June bug. It was built by Glenn Curtis. Now, the interesting thing about the June bug is it's best known as the first aircraft to complete a greater than one nautical mile circuit. Take off, fly on greater than one nautical mile circuit and land. And that's a big achievement. And before, pretty much all the flights were down a line. They were linear, like the Wright brothers on the beach. And so while you needed to have control and stability to keep it going and going in the same direction, it didn't really have the capability to do global, in a sense, navigation. And then Junebug did this. It's also one of the aircraft that kind of typifies the typical control systems that we saw for a long time in an aircraft. It had a wheel or what we call a yoke that you turn to make the aircraft roll and pull forward and push, pull back and push forward to make the aircraft uh, climb and descend. It had rudders and all the like. It was kind of a step beyond that which the Wright brothers built and to what we more know today. It's kind of like when you think about the Cadillac that put the pedals in the same place that we used to, the, the, the throttle accelerator, the brake, and the clutch pedals. And it was a Cadillac that invented that, and it's rolled out to the world. So in a sense, this is what the June book's all about. But again, it's best known as the first aircraft to complete a full circuit, take off, circuit, and land back at the same spot for greater than a mile. So that's the big artifact. And that was back in 1908. So only five years, less than five years after um, the Wright brothers first flew. So we've locked that kind of stuff in really early on. Um, the next aircraft, we'll go into the 1930s, are Boeing 247. And this is a really big deal, even though Commercially, it was a dead end. It never went anywhere. Boeing tried it, they kind of exited the market. They didn't become the player. Remember, in the major player in the US after this was Douglas, the DCs, the DC-2, DC-3. But this is the first stress skin, semi-monocoque, retractable gear transport aircraft. Before that, we either had fabric, and wood, and metal and fabric, or we had corrugated aluminum, like on the Fulker trimotor and the Ford trimotor. This one, the skin carries a significant amount of load. It's structurally not really any different to an A320 or an A380 or 737 that you get on today. And it was built for United Airlines. And a little side effect on, side on this was, believe it or not, at the time, Boeing owned half of United Airlines. And the company that made the engines, Pratt & Whitney, owned the other half. And the US Justice Department sued what was called then called the United Aircraft Corporation on the United Airlines Corporation, they split off. And that's today now United Technologies that owns Pratt & Whitney, Boeing that owns Boeing, um, which of course we can talk about their more recent history, but you know, obviously they became a massive player in commercial transports and still are. And then United Airlines, which is one of the three large airlines in the United States and one of the largest in the world. So, but the Boeing 247, first stress skin, what we call semi-monocoque. That means 
the skin plus some stiffeners, frames and stringers takes the load uh, transport aircraft. And then we have the DC-3, C-47. So this is really the first globally successful transport aircraft. Now, what's interesting is people think of the DC-3 in thousands being built and thousands to the point the only aircraft that have come anywhere close to the A320 and 737 series. But in reality, there were only a few hundred DC-3s ever built. Most of them are C-47s, which was a military variant built for the US Army Air Corps and several other militaries, including the RAF and the like. And then what happened at the end of the Second World War, after they built many thousands of these, over 10,000 in total, they were in surplus. And the US government sold them for a song to anybody that wanted them. So while there weren't very many DC-3s, there were lots of C-47s that were converted back to civilian use. And this became the aircraft that enabled what we would call regional flight. That flight from here to London or the short distance flights, picking up small numbers of people going every which way. Compared to today, it was a tiny market but it opened up the market. And it wasn't until the late 1960s that you really started seeing these aircraft get replaced in, in the market. And they were replaced by the likes of the 737 and the DC-9 and the Sud Aviation Carvel and the Fulker 28, F-28. And it was the standard bearer. It's what the first aircraft that most people of that era, if they flew, ever flew on. The fun thing is, because the DC-3 is a relatively simple aircraft, it's not pressurized, none of that, it's still flying today. And they use it to deliver packages in the bush in Alaska or in Antarctica even. Um, they put skis on it. They've done all floats, all sorts of modifications. So when we think about it, Douglas, DC, Douglas Craft, 3 C-47, is one of those standard bearers in commercial aviation. And it was sold worldwide. Unlike most of the Imperial British airliners that were built for one airline, and even the Boeing 247 that was built effectively for one airline. This was that first kind of useful general use cell to every one aircraft. Okay, let's talk about a slightly less important aircraft. And this is, of course, the Dablin Comet. This is a Comet 4. And we all know about the Comet, and we've probably heard about the uh, disasters with the fatigue and the observer's window, which was located um, up above the cockpit and causing in-flight breakups that caused the aircraft to be grounded for several years and had to be totally redesigned. And it's, people say it's because we didn't understand metal fatigue. We understood metal fatigue. When Boeing built the first pressurized transport aircraft, which was based off the B-17 design, um, they had curved windows. That uh, was the first in-service commercialized transport. Lockheed built a prototype before that. They had rounded corners. We all knew about metal fatigue. What we didn't understand was um, kind of how, where the breakpoints were in the design. But that's not the reason the comet really was not that important. It wasn't important because it was quickly superseded by overall better configurations. We don't see aircraft that look like the Comet today with the mildly swept wing, the unswept empennage, the engines in the wing route. It just doesn't scale. It's not economically successful in that sense. And there were much better designs. We see that today in everything. The A320, the A350, the A380, the 737, 777, they don't look like a Comet. They look like a different aircraft. They look like this which is actually a bomber. This is the US B-47, Boeing B-47. And this is the first example of a highly swept, thin wing, underslung out in front in a cell jet transport. The Americans developed some of this technology on their own. A lot of the technology in terms of swept wing, they got from the Germans when they, uh, at the end of the Second World War. And this aircraft changed design basically overnight. And because of that, it set the standard. It enabled them to come up with better transport aircraft. And in fact, it wasn't just this design that evolved. It was the need to service this aircraft because this is a strategic bomber. It's a medium bomber versus the B-52, which is the heavy bomber. And it had to be refueled, but it couldn't fly slow enough or barely could fly slow enough to be refueled from the KB-50s that were based on the 
the uh, B-29 and B-50 and uh, model bombers, the prop-driven straight-wing bombers, could barely fly slow enough for the top speed that that aircraft could fly to be refueled. So what we did is we designed this. And the Americans designed this. It was originally commissioned by Boeing as an answer to that problem. Boeing knew about the problem. The US Air Force didn't. And they designed the 367-80, which became the 707 and the KC-135 to meet that need. Again, swept wing. This time it's a low wing because of the the needs and the issues with servicing on the ground and the like, same underslung nacelles out in front of the wing, swept on panache. And this is the standard bearer. Now, an interesting story about this is this aircraft was designed and had a fuselage diameter. It's the same fuselage diameter that's in the KC-135 uh, refueling and transport aircraft. It is not the same air fuselage that was used in the 707, and then ultimately later in the 727, 737, and 757, at least the upper above the passenger cabin diameter. What happened was late in the game, Douglas with their DC-8 competitor changed, made their cabin wider. And Pan Am, who was a big deal at the time, said, we're gonna buy the Douglas aircraft unless you can provide more space in your cabin. So at the last minute, after tooling was built, Boeing widened the fuselage and made it actually just a little bit wider than the DCA. The next aircraft is a standard bearer. It didn't go very big, but this was the first aircraft, first jet transport, the Sud Aviation Caravel, to have the engines off at the back of the aircraft before the VC-10, before the 727, DC-9, Bach 111, all of those. It set that standard. So as you can see here, we have the two standard bearers for basically all transport aircraft types, including a lot of bombers. We have the low wing engines on the wing, the low wing engines in the back. And those are the two basic types. Biz jets, our regional aircraft use this, longer range aircraft tended to that. A350, A380, 747, 787, all basically a variation on that theme. And so that's why these are the big aircraft that you care about in commercial. If we move, to the future, we have to The 727, the Hawker Siddeley Trident, they were designed to start doing this. Fly in to those low, small, unimproved airports that didn't have a lot of infrastructure so that you could replace the DCA. Interesting thing about 727, it doesn't need ground support in the same way a 707 did. It has integral air stairs at the back of the aircraft and optional air stairs that come out beneath the front door. It also was the first aircraft to have an APU, first jet aircraft to have an APU. So it means it didn't need ground power. You could go to an unimproved airfield, land, drop the back steps, maybe open the front door, let everybody off, turn the engines off, run your APU, have power. If you didn't even need fuel, you want to do next hop to the next city, you could just close it up, take off again, and do the same thing at these unimproved things. In fact, it wasn't that long ago that airlines in the US basically flew circuits. They'd fly out of Minneapolis or Salt Lake City, fly to several of these airports in the, in the Mountain West of the US. The airports would be nice airfields, but they wouldn't have a lot of services, and you could do that. And it was this type of aircraft. Well, that evolved. We needed something even smaller. So this carried around 110 people. We needed something that carried under 100 people, and we got the 737 and DC-9s and the like, and we have the A380. And obviously these two families are now the most popular aircraft ever built. Well over 10,000 have been ordered and delivered of the 737. And I believe now the A380, A320 series has had its 10,000th delivery. And there hasn't been a commercial civil transport that's even come close to this. Keep in mind, in 1983, Boeing wrapped up production of the 727. At that time, the most popular jet transport ever made. They built 1,830 of them, 1,830. That's almost a tenth of what they've now had orders for 737s and A320s. So that tells you the difference in the size of the market. But that's not the king of them all. This aircraft is the most produced manned aircraft in history. They built over 60,000 of these. And this is the venerable Cessna 172. It is an aircraft, they actually built so many they had to stop production because 
the market didn't need anymore. They stopped production for 10 years and then restarted production when enough of them wore out or crashed. And it is kind of the standard bearer as a trainer aircraft. They call this the automatic landing aircraft because if you're a student pilot on final approach and things are getting a little hairy, you can literally just let go Put your hands behind your head, and in most cases, the plane will land itself. Not smoothly, not nice, it won't be comfortable, but you aren't going to prang it. It takes effort to break this aircraft. And the way you break it is you porpoise it. So you get a little low, you pull back too much, it goes up, you push forward, and you drive the prop into the ground. And most of the time, it'll do. If you don't mess it up, it won't break and it won't kill you. So 60,000, the most produced manned aircraft in history, more than any bomber or transport aircraft or trainer in the Second World War, Cessna 172. That's a big deal. Now that compare that, 60,000 aircraft over 70 years versus 850,000 pickup trucks, F1, Ford F-150s in the US alone per year. We're talking massively different scales, but that's the king of them all. Okay, let's move on to military aircraft, jets. So ME-262. This is the first truly combat jet aircraft to see service in combat. Now, at the same time that the Germans were developing their jet fighters, so were the British with the Gloucester Meteor. What was the difference? Well, one, the Germans were losing the war. They were getting bombed constantly. We had strategic bombers, 750 to 1,000 bomber flights bombing a city, firebombing Hamburg or Japan or any of that. <clears throat> and then the German regime really wanted something that could answer that. And there wasn't anything that the Allies had that could answer this, save maybe the Gloucester Meteor. But while the Germans were desperate, the British were not at this point. And they didn't want to lose any of their precious cost or meteors. So they actually held them back. Now, which aircraft was a better aircraft? There's a lot of debate. A lot of people would say this one is, but it's a moot point. They never really saw action against each other because of that. But this is that first point. And it really showed the advantage. It showed the end of the piston era. For all of the flaws of the early jets, all of the high fuel consumption, all of that, it was a much simpler design. It was going, had a had place to grow. The piston engines were massive. They were unreliable. In fact, more B-29s were lost, and we'll talk about B-29s in a minute, were lost to engine fires than to enemy action. And it was because of the complex systems and complex engines. And the future was the jet. Another aircraft that was very important, one that doesn't get its due. I want you to think about what this is. Everybody knows about the Spitfire but most people tend not to remember the Hawker Hurricane. And this was the aircraft that actually won the Battle of Britain. It was the aircraft that they could produce enough of to the point that they had more aircraft and pilots were the concern. It was the aircraft that they never had to stop production during the Blitz or during the Battle of Britain. It was the aircraft that saved the UK. So remember, it doesn't get its due. It turns out to be more important in many respects than it's more famous and really more capable sister. But this one was much easier to build. It was wooden fabric, tubular and fabric with a metal wing. It didn't have that highly contoured elliptical wing that's finicky and hard to build. You could mass produce this aircraft. You couldn't mass produce early Spitfires. And then there's this one. Now, this is the B-29. Super Fortress. It was the largest of the heavy bombers built during the Second World War, the sea service. It is also best known as the only aircraft to operationally drop and deploy a nuclear weapon. So two atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the purpose of this aircraft really was to be able to bomb Germany from North America or Iceland. And this is why the Americans invaded Iceland and they didn't really invade Iceland. They were, Iceland invited them, but that's why they, so they could theoretically use this aircraft there. But the more interesting thing is at the time, this was the most expensive weapon system ever developed anywhere in the world. Boeing and the US Army Air Corps spent more money, more time than the Manhattan Project by a long shot. It was such a big deal. And just the computers, the analog computers that controlled the guns was such a big deal that when these would be landed and ditched in the Soviet Union doing reconnaissance runs off Japan when they had ran it or bombing runs off Japan when they had engine trouble or the like, 
just that alone, just breaking those systems down, advanced the Soviet analog computing system by 10 years in the span of eight to 12 months. It was a big deal. It was so complex, so cumbersome. It was such a big uh, problematic aircraft, but it was also very successful. Again, most expensive weapon system ever developed at the end of the Second World War. This is where we started talking about systems engineering. So when you hear about systems engineering, the failure and success of the B-29 program was part of it. Now, I said more of these were lost to engine fires than enemy action. These highly complex multiple row radial engines had turbo superchargers on the top. It got very, very hot. Radial engines are well known for leaking a lot of oil. In fact, most of these aircraft for the B-29 were limited not by fuel, range was not limited by fuel capacity, but by oil capacity. So the engines would leak oil, they leak it onto the turbo supercharger, it would catch fire. The turbo supercharger was made of magnesium, that would catch fire. Magnesium fires are very bad. You don't want that. We burn through the wing spark, wing would fall off, plane would crash. That's why we lost a lot. And it was that that really convinced the Americans that they needed something better. And they ultimately went to jets because of that. Okay, some also rams, some not so important aircraft. So we have these three aircraft. And the first one is the US uh, North American XB-70. It was the prototype for a 5,000 nautical mile range, 25 ton payload Mach 3 cruise strategic bomber, ultimately to replace the B-52. The reason it's an also ram is at the same time, the advancements of ICBMs <clears throat> and SAM surface air missiles rendered this corner obsolete. It was a corner, it wasn't any place, it wasn't gonna develop anymore. But this aircraft and this aircraft have approximately the same payload. Now, this is obviously designed to carry people and baggage. This was designed to carry nuclear weapons. They are not exactly the same. So internal volume, usable volume on this is much higher than this. But this has ultimately had about a 2,700 nautical, 3,000 nautical mile range. This had a 5,500 nautical mile range. It was only about 25% more massive of an aircraft. It flew at Mach 3. We talk about Concorde as having the best ML over D of any aircraft ever. No, this was even better. Um, it advanced materials, manufacturing significantly, but as an aircraft, it was a dead end program. We learned a lot when NASA took this over and flew it, um, and they actually built two of them. And the better one was lost in a mid-air collision. We can talk more about that if you want. And that was used and available for these kind of developments on Concorde and, of course, the TU-144. Now, the interesting thing is all of these aircraft were designed to cruise at supersonic speeds. And Concorde actually holds the record for most hours of a fleet of aircraft flown at supersonic speeds. No other aircraft comes close. The closest maybe is the SR-71, and that's still well behind. But there is actually footage of this aircraft, a modified version of the T-144, following the Concorde to take samples. And that's a very strange and almost unheard of thing. In case, most cases, we don't have the, the, the endurance at supersonic speeds to do that. But the modified version of this, which did finally super cruise, could do that. Again, they went nowhere. Um, the market's gone. We can't fly. We're talking about it maybe in the future, but we're not there. What I will tell you about Concorde, even though it is a bit overhyped, is it showed the way cooperation. It told the French and the British to a slightly lesser extent that they could cooperate with each other. And as a result, Aerospatiale, which came out of Sud Aviation, went and talked to the Germans, and they formed Airbus. And it's because of the success and the challenges and the lessons learned in Concorde that we have Airbus today. And ultimately, the British joined as BAE, or British Aerospace joined. They've left, but there's still a British part of Airbus. And that's why. It's because of the legacy of Concorde. So we talk about it as a dead end in terms of transport, but it is a very important aircraft in terms of collaboration and lessons learned for future collaboration. Okay. That was fixed wing aircraft. We're gonna do a brief time on uh, rotary wing aircraft and that'll bring us to the end of the video one. And then we'll talk about space and astronautics in video two. So 
We talked about this before. Here's Igor Sikorsky in his R4. And this was the first operational helicopter. Single main rotor set the standard for configuration operation, was used actually during the Second World War and has evolved. And we talked about it. It's this configuration that you see on most helicopters today. There are a few other ones like the tandem on the Chinook or the tilt rotors or all of that. But this is the most common by far. And this is the first really operational one we had and everything comes after that. Obviously, lots of advancements after that, especially in propulsion system. Those gas turbine engines, jet engines turned into turbo shafts. We got a lot more power to weight, a lot better improvements there. This is what we call the flying banana. The Paiseki helicopters. Ultimately, Paiseki was built. He started a company called Vertol, V-E-R-T-O-L. He was later forced out. That became ultimately Boeing Vertol. This is the progenitor of the tandem. The Chinook is the aircraft we know. And it's really, really efficient for heavy lift helicopters. <clears throat> so it's a starter. I was built to do servicing ships. Um, the US Navy used to use these for resupply and also to move uh, amphibious assaults. Um, the C-46, which that's been replaced by the CV-22, the tilt rotor, um, but the Chinook lives on. And it is a beast of a helicopter. In fact, in places like Afghanistan, high altitude, it has much better payload performance than almost any other military helicopter out there. And so it's a testament to that design. Um, but this is the king of rotorcraft. It wasn't that long ago we wouldn't have talked about this, but the advent of the drone, the multi-rotor drone, there are more of these have been built and sold in the last five years than helicopters in history, than helicopters in history. And this really is the future in a lot of respects. It's simple. It only works because of flight, automated flight control. There is no way that a human can reliably control those four motors individually, but a computer can do it for you, can do it fast enough, can keep that, and it makes it much easier to fly. It is the simplified way. And this is now scaling up. So we're getting manned versions of these multi-rotors, 16, 20, 32 rotors. Not necessarily the most efficient designs, believe um, imaginable, but easy to do, easy to scale. I'll do the advent of microprocessors and microcontrollers and very light, high power density electric motors. Okay, so that brings us to the end of artifacts of import and aeronautics. Somewhere in there was my favorite aircraft. I want you to think about it, see if you can guess. You can talk to anybody you want. We're gonna have that in the quiz. In video number two, we're gonna go through astronautics, both launch vehicles and satellites and talk about it in the same way. I right, thank you very much and hope to see you then.